his teacher. Thus we understand why did the Alter Rebbe mention the Magyar and the Baal Shem Tov when relating this particular teacher. It is possible to resolve this difficulty based on another Talmudic passage. Our sages relate that in the Beis HaMikdash, in the Temple, the Kohanim would announce that the time for the morning services had arrived by proclaiming, quote, in the east, it is shining until Hebron, the city of Hebron. Why do they mention Hebron each and every day? To allude to the patriarchs. It was an allusion to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who are buried there in Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah. So the Kohanim would announce that the time for the morning service for Shachris, by saying, in the east, it is shining there in Hebron, and therefore, with the inspiration of the patriarchs who are buried in Hebron, we will pray. We find a similar concept in our prayer service, which was instituted in place of sacrifices. Chakras and Mincha and even Marv, to a certain degree, were instituted because of the sacrifices. The Chakras, the morning sacrifice, Mincha, the afternoon sacrifices, the Korban Mincha, and the evening because the, e the afternoon sacrifices could be still uh, burning even through the night. Every day during the week on Shabbos and even on Yom Kippur, <clears throat> we follow a similar pattern and begin the Shema Nesrei by praising God as the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. But as we know, the um, Amida mentions all three patriarchs. So we, why do we mention all three patriarchs? To show that in their merit, we are davening, we are praying. And their strength, spiritually, should give us strength through our prayer. Similarly, in regard to the teachings mentioned by the Alter Rebbe, which also contains an aspect of prayer, that God grants abundant blessings in the new year which comes. After all, the prayer for the new month is a prayer. The patriarchs of the Hasidic movement are mentioned also. Just like in the Shemona story, we mentioned Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. In the, um, in the saying of the Alter Rebbe, we mentioned the Alter Rebbe, the Magad, and the, Mez uh, and the, and the Baal Shem Tov. Mentioning their names brings about a more powerful revelation than merely having them in mind on the level of thought. So when we mention their names, this brings a powerful energy to the world. By saying the Baal Shem Tov, by saying the Magid of Mezrich, by saying Rosh Nir Zalman, the Alter Rebbe, we bring a certain chayas, a certain divine energy and power to the world, just like by mentioning Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And that's why the previous Rebbe mentions these three. Uh, there is a further, con and that's even more than just keeping in them in mind by mentioning them. There is a further connection to the morning service, sacrifice. On one hand, the morning sacrifice was the same every single day. Every day of the year, the, the same rites were observed. We say, The first part, the first three brachas of the Shema Nisrei, which are brachas of praise, are exactly the same every, every time we pray. Shachr, whether it's the Amida of Shachris, the Amida of Mincha, the Amida of Mara, the, even the Amida of of uh, Nila and Yom Kippur. They're all exactly, the first three brachas are exactly the same. Conversely, however, each day the intention of the sacrifice was different, appropriate to the uniqueness of that day. And after those three brachas, we find that the body of the Amida is also quite different every day, whether it's uh, a holiday or Shabbos, or Yom Kippur, for this reason, it was necessary to offer a new sacrifice each day. In fact, the Kohanim would have to have a different intentions in mind when they offered those sacrifices, things that they were asking for the Jewish people, things that they were requesting. A similar concept applies in regard to each new year. The root of the Hebrew year word for year, Shana, is also related to the word meaning change, lishanot, to change, and repetition as well. The word shana can also mean repetition. Thus, our sages have explained that each year is a complete cycle, 
which includes the entire series of changes and developments which transpire, and the year that follows is merely a repetition. So we have different aspects involved with this. On one hand, there is a repetition of the previous year. On the other hand, there are new changes and developments in the coming year as well. Certainly this year with the coronavirus, many people will be staying home. They're not going to go to synagogue. I was talking to a number of people already who are saying they're not coming to shul this year. They're afraid. Uh, too, too many people. And uh, they don't want to get sick or they don't want their children or their spouses to get sick or they don't want to get sick. And as a result of it, they're going to be observing uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and probably all the holidays at home this year. Something unparalleled. Something that has never happened in, in many, many, many years. But nevertheless, we certainly understand everyone is coming from a different place. Everyone has different feelings and sees the world differently. And, uh, but nevertheless, people will not be coming to shul in many cases. Here in Chabad University City, we will be having services for those who want to come. They'll be outside. Masks are required. Social distancing will be observed. But there will be <coughs> many people who won't be there. And I understand that and I respect that. But it's interesting, wherever you are, in whichever circumstance you are finding yourself, which is quite different than we've been observing the last many years, this year there will be something very similar. Everybody will be hearing the shofar together. If you have a shofar in your house or you want to come to shul and just hear the shofar, that's fine also here. We're blowing the shofar at 12 o'clock and again at 6 o'clock on Sunday. Everyone will be hearing the shofar. Everyone will be reciting the same Shema Nesrei together, everyone, wherever you are and whoever you are. So there's that repetition. There's that sameness that every single Jew throughout the world, in every place, whether it's your home or whether it's a synagogue or wherever you may be, we are all in this together. Nevertheless, each year is also a new development. So on one hand, there is a sameness to it all. On the other hand, there is a newness to it all. Ve'elech. As the Alter Rebbe writes in Tanya, each year a new light, which has never shone before, descends and shines. A higher light than shone during the period of the Beis HaMikdash even. And even in Gan Eden, even in Paradise, even in the Garden of Eden, a new light that never was there before is revealed this coming year. So this coming year has some incredible divine revelations, divine inspiration, uh, divine energy that is coming to the entire world this coming year. And hopefully, God willing, this coming year we'll have a vaccine for the virus and we'll get back to uh, life as usual. The Alter Rebbe's teaching continues. He says as follows, the blessing that is found in the, uh, the blessing for the new month is contained in the Torah reading, where it says, you are standing all together today. Atem nitzavim hayom, today you're standing. The word today refers to Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment. You are standing victorious in judgment. That we know that the judgment that will happen will be a good judgment. It will be a positive judgment for us and for all of mankind. Therefore, on the Shabbos before Rosh Hashanah, we read the parasha Atem Nitzavim. This is God's blessing conveyed on the Shabbos, which blesses the seventh month, which is a month of abundance. And the source, what, what is that? It's abundant with mitzvahs, abundant with holidays, and the source of abundant blessings for all of Israel for the entire year to come. The month of Tishrei is a very auspicious month a month of many, many holidays, many blessings that come down to us from God during this month. It says, Atem Nitzavim, you, you are all standing, refers to each and every Jew. Our standing implies a powerful and firm stance. Indeed, we find the root of the Hebrew word standing, Nitzav, is referred to, is used in relation to a king. This implies that a Jew stands with the power of a king. We know that on Rosh Hashanah, we coronate God as our king. Uh, we make God into our king. And therefore, many of the prayers of Rosh Hashanah have to do with coronating God as our king. 
Malchios is one of the three uh, prayers that we offer on at Musaf, etc. But in other respects, the, the Rebbe points out that we are all, we all stand with the power of a king, also each and every one of us. Our sages declare when the king speaks, mountains are moved. Mountains refer to our material concerns. So when we speak, when we pray to God, when we ask God to do things, God literally moves mountains for us. They are not destroyed, but rather moved, transformed, transferred into holiness. So the power of our prayer on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur has an incredible energy to it that can move, literally move mountains. So when we daven, whether it's at shul, whether it's at home, we should recognize the fact that these prayers are very, very important. Uh, the portion continues, Hayom, today. Atem Ritzavim Hayom, today. You are standing today. Uh, it doesn't just mean uh, ancient days. It means every day. Today, the day of Rosh Hashanah it's referring to. The day of great judgment. Although, from one perspective, judgment is associated with limitation, from a deeper view, it is through judgment that overwhelming energy is conveyed. Judgment is a powerful thing, if you think about it. On one hand, uh, when there is a judgment, for example, you stand before a judge, and the judge renders his verdict, uh, it's very little to change that verdict. It's a, it's a hard thing, unless you're going to appeal it, or you take time. It's a powerful thing that a judge does. He makes a verdict. So in, in many respects, there is a limitation to that verdict. On a deeper view, through that judgment, energy is conveyed. The judge is telling you, listen, this is my judgment. You're going to have to pay the certain fine. You're going to have to spend time in jail. You're going to, you're going to need to do certain things. And what that judgment does is that judgment conveys a message to the person who is being judged that that person has to recognize what they did. Uh, recently, I just finished a book from somebody who, uh, who was involved with a fraud, and uh, he ended up spending uh, many years in, in prison. And um, he wrote a book about his experience, which I found very interesting. And, um, he, but he recognized, as a result of that whole experience, and being judged, and the verdict, and everything was, that he needs to change his life around. And he needs to become more of a productive citizen and take responsibility for the things he does in this world. I was very impressed by that, that he had the strength and the courage to be able to, to take that advice. And uh, even though I mentioned to him in an uh, email, I said, you know, I don't think you're, you have enough remorse for what you did. I mean, there's remorse, but not enough. I think that you need to pay back the people you hurt that you got, took money from, and you need to correct this. You need to make this thing better, a little bit more than you are now. Well, I was expecting from him that he was going to let me have it, but I served my time already. I did what I had to do already. Everyone said I didn't do anything wrong anyways, but no. What he said was, Rabbi Leader, you are absolutely right. I really need to do that, and I'm going to rewrite my book, and I'm going to... Um, show more remorse for what I did, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life paying back those people that I defrauded. I was so impressed by that. What a bench. Obviously, here's somebody who really, really, really learned a lesson from what he went through, and therefore the judgment and the verdict, and in fact, all the time he spent in prison was probably worth it, just for him to recognize the fact that he needs to change and to improve his life. I was very impressed by that. This energy, the Rebbe said, can be expressed in the service of the Jews in Torah and mitzvahs, which will ultimately permeate through and affect the material nature of the world. Uniting, existing, unifying existence in this material world with its source in God's true existence. So by, by um, davening on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, by doing the proper teshuva and repentance, by by, by accepting the judgment that God is giving us, and by going through all of this, we actually help to raise up the world 
and make the world into a holier place, into a better place, even the physical world, and making the physical world into a better place. Uh, and again, during this time, we're in the midst of a very severe uh, virus, which is a very materialistic thing, and it's affecting our materialistic existence in so many ways. Many people are out of work, uh, people are, are stuck at home, people are in quarantine, uh, people are very careful, they're wearing masks all the time and, space, and separating themselves from other people. It has caused a great deal of material anxiety, anxiety about our material existence. Uh, no one could deny that. Our world has changed. Uh, hopefully it'll change again for the better after this, but it has certainly changed. You go into a, uh, into a grocery store, I remember uh, the first time in six months I went into a grocery store with my mask and even with my gloves on, I needed something. So I went into a grocery store and I walked right up to the counter and three other people behind me said, uh, excuse me, you gotta get in line. I said, what line? I can't see a line. I turned to the back and I see these, these stickers on the floor that say, keep your distance six feet away from each other. You gotta go to the back of the line and each and in the back of each line, there's a sticker, and you have to stand near that sticker and keep your distance from each other. So we need to uh, check. So obviously, even the way we go to the grocery store has changed for us. Our whole world has changed for us. Doctors are now giving, giving uh, examinations by Zoom, and so on and so forth. So the world has changed tremendously. But Rosh Hashanah elevates the world. It makes the world, the material existence of the world, holier and better. We should hope, God willing, that this coming year, that our material world should be better as well. Afterwards, the portion continues, Kulchem, Atem Hayam, Kulchem Hayom. You are all together, that the Jews stand as a single communal entity. This brings them before God, before the Lord your God and causes them to be victorious in judgment. So, how are we victorious in judgment? First, by doing teshuva, by doing proper repentance between man and man, between man and God, fixing up, correcting what we did wrong, improving ourselves, teshuva. Second of all, prayer, tefillah. We need to increase our tefillah, our prayer. Spend more time davening, saying tehillim. Uh, davening with more kavana, with more intent, making our prayers count more than ever before. And you don't really need to be in shul to do that. You can do that anywhere. But prayer is a very, very, very important thing to do. And not only just the prayers from the moxer, from the book, the prayer book, but prayers from our heart. Prayers that we feel that we need to offer to God to make this world into a better place. And thirdly, of course, we need to demonstrate to God that through acts of kindness, tzedakah, not just monetary, but in general, helping other people, being concerned about other people, then this also God will cause God to be concerned about us. God gives to those who give to others. By us doing something for Hashem, Hashem will do for us as well. And in so doing all of that, then then we will, we will have a, a, a better year, a more positive year. And we will be victorious in this judgment that God willing, soon after the holidays, or even before the holidays, when we make a resolve to do it, uh, we will find that this virus will go away. And above, the above is enhanced, the Rebbe says, by the influence of Parshas Vayelech, which indicates that from the powerful stance of Nitzavim, a Jew must proceed from strength to strength. This is further enhanced by the mitzvah of Hakel, mentioned in this portion. In Hakel, the Jews are fused together. They came together right after Yom Kippur. They came together and they, uh, they heard the Torah being read, parts of the book of Devarim by the, by the uh, Kohen Gadol. He read it. And, by, and the leader of the Jewish people, he, the Jews are fused together as a single entity, and they are inspired by the king's reading of the Torah. Well, the king, I'm sorry, the king read the Torah. So the power of the king reading the Torah gave, again, the Jewish people all the energy to, um, 
to have a good year. This leads to the conclusion of the portion, where it says, And Moshe spoke the words of the song, so that all the community of Israel would hear until its end. The Hebrew word for until its end, tamam, can be interpreted until they become perfect, or tamim. This prepares them for Parshas Hazinu, which is the Shabbos after uh, Rosh Hashanah, which, as our scriptures explain, reflects a situation where one is closer to heaven and far removed from the earth. Already in this Hazinu, Hazinu is a song that we sing that is, goes beyond the earth and goes up to heaven. So Hazinu HaShamayim, Radei Breira, says, give hearken to the, to the heavens that they should hear. One is closer to heaven and far removed from the earth. And that is, in fact, where we are during the High Holidays. During the High Holidays, the Jew, in many respects, leaves the world. We are on a higher level than the, the low physical world. Although this level was achieved by Moshe alone, each Jew has a spark of Moshe in his midst. Hence, this is relevant to him as well. So during the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, a Jew is in a different level, a different plateau than they were during the rest of the year. And we relate to the world differently. In fact, when we meet non-Jews in the street, we talk to them, we are coming from a Tishrei frame of mind. So that Tishrei is our whole frame of mind during this time. We are living it, we're eating it, we're breathing it, we're experiencing it. Um, and it's interesting, you know, very often uh, people come to me for a letter for their boss or students for their teacher, telling them that they can't go to school, they can't go to work during these particular days uh, because of the religious holiday. And in fact, I'm happy to do it. But it's a true thing. They, they're, they're not in school, they're not in work during this time. This time we are beyond work, we're beyond school. We're on a higher level. And he says, this is the final Shabbos of the seven Shabbos of Consolation. During the last seven weeks, we read seven special Haftorahs. These are called Shiva de Bechemta, the seven Shabbos of Consolation. And they begin with the twofold message of comfort, uh, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, God comforts my people, which uh, Shabbos Nachamu is the Shabbos after, right after Tisha B'Av, where God says, I comfort you, my people, based on the principle of Milam B'Kaidish, we go higher in, in holiness, the Ein Marita, and not lower. We can assume that from Shabbos to Shabbos, particularly on this, the final and concluding Shabbos of the seven, special Shabbos from Tisha B'Av, this consolation, this comfort that we are getting from God for losing the temple and for being in exile increases and grows every single week. So we are on a stronger, higher plateau already, even before Rosh Hashanah, than we were before. This leads us to the 10 days of repentance. After, during Rosh Hashanah, we have 10 days of repentance from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah are the first two days of, of the 10. Yom Kippur is the last, the tenth. These ten days can be seen as a summation of the seven Shabbos of consolation and the three Shabbos which precede them. So, during this time of the ten days of repentance, uh, we see the summation of all of the comfort and all of the consolation that we had before, and it reached its culmination during this time. We're living during powerful times. This Shabbos is also the last Shabbos of the month of Elul, the month of mercy, when the king is in the field, as we said. And God comes out to reach all the Jewish people wherever they are. This is reflected in the fact that although usually on the Shabbos when a new month is blessed, the passage of Harachamim is not recited, on this Shabbos when God blesses the coming month, it is customarily said. So this because Avarachmi means Father of Mercy. This reflects the all-encompassing influence of Divine Mercy. That Divine Mercy is very, very powerful during this time. 
And therefore, we call God Av HaRachamim, which is the prayer we usually omit on the Shabbos of Archim. But this Shabbos, we, we say it to, to emphasize and to stress the idea that God, who is the divine, merciful one, will bestow mercy upon all of us. This leads to the prayer Ashrei, right after Av HaRachamim, we say Ashrei. And what does Ashrei mean? It means happy. Happy are those that dwell in your house. In the base of Migdash, and then on to the conclusion of the prayers. The upright will dwell in your presence, as it says, the word for your presence can mean your inner dimension. For God's inner dimension is related to the inner dimension of us, the Jews. The Jews are connected to Hashem's inner dimension. This, in turn, gives the Jews the power to declare, give ear heavens, uh, a Jew reveals how he has control over the heavens and the earth, which is Hazinu. Hazinu re represents the strength, the power of a Jew to have control over heaven and of earth. And we have that tremendous power to do that as well. So the Rebbe continues, it is customary to conclude with directives from action. When the Rebbe gave up for bringing a gathering, he was not happy with simply relating Torah teachings, or learning a new Rashi, a new explanation. But the Fabrengen had to have a, had to have a, um, a uh, purpose. It had to have an action. Bechein, uh, as the Hasidim would say. It means to have a, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do about it? So he mentions, as mentioned several times this year, efforts should be made to, get, made to gather Jews together on Shabbos in synagogues or to study Torah and discuss directives for action. As you know, the Rebbe had a 10-point mitzvah, ten point mitzvah campaign. Um, among them are uh, to keep kosher, to have Jewish books in your house, to study Torah, to love your fellow Jew, to uh, have mezuzahs on your doors, to put on tefillin every day, to the women should light Shabbos candles. Um, um, you know, I think I missed a few of them over there. Mezuzah, uh, Tefillin, Avos Yisrael. So these things, these mitzvah campaigns, um, were a, a call to action from the Rebbe. When a Jew enters a synagogue, he feels he is in the presence of a king. He's in God's house. If many Jews come together, then among the multitude of people is the glory of the king. We say, Barovam Hadras Melech. God is glorified when there's a lot of people there. Even a child who enters a synagogue sees the ark and the Torah scrolls, and he's impressed by that. He comes into the synagogue and he knows that this is God's place. This is where the king lives. This is where the king dwells. It's a very, very powerful place. Uh, for those people who are not coming to shul, on Shabbos or on Yantef, I hope you don't get used to this because our purpose, our job, is to be in shul on Shabbos, to daven in a minyan, to pray in a minyan. It is not good not to daven in a minyan, to, to save your life, and for health purposes you are permitted to, but in general it's not a good thing. At present, it's important to concentrate on efforts to provide all the needy with their holiday needs, and thus they can eat succulent foods, and drink sweet beverages on Rosh Hashanah. So it's important for us to make sure that those people who have needs, who, who have needs, their needs are taken care of. We in Chabad traditionally disperse food and money for people who are in need during the holiday, especially during this difficult time. And if you know of anyone who is in need, especially in our community, of financial help or whatever, please let me know. We'd be happy to help them out through food or for money or whatever their needs may be. Uh, so the Rebbe continues how important it is to provide for those needs. This need is further emphasized by the fact that Shabbos follows directly after Rosh Hashanah. Well, in, in that case, uh, there was Rosh Hashanah, then there was Shabbos. This year, however, it's the opposite. This year, we have Shabbos, and then we have Shabbos is Rosh Hashanah, the first day. Then right after that, we have the second day Rosh Hashanah, which, second day Rosh Hashanah, which is Sunday. But they're one right after the other. They're consecutive days. 
So consecutive meals are necessary. We need to provide people for food for the first day and the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And this applies both in Eretz Yisrael and in the diaspora. So by helping people, I just received notice, notification that the Jews in Israel are hurting badly. There are many organizations, including Chabad, which provides aid for uh, needy people in Israel to make sure that they have their holiday needs, not just for Rosh Hashanah, but also for Sukkot as well. Dear Lord, please keep that in mind. There is another unique aspect to, the, to this, um, that um, we have Rosh Hashanah, and then we have the Song Gedalia, the Fast of Gedalia. Um, let's see, in those days, that year, Song Gedalia came, it was postponed because of Shabbos. Okay, we'll skip that. According to Chabad custom of studying Pirkei Avos, Ethics of the Fathers, throughout the entire summer, we, as we know, um, the, the most of the world, they read one chapter of Pirkei Avos, is Ethics of the Fathers, every Shabbos until Shavuos. Chabad continues after Shavuos as well, through the summer, and in the three weeks before Rosh Hashanah, we double up. So this coming week, here in San Diego, we'll be reading chapters 5 and 6. And we'll be concluding the study of Perkyos for the year then. then. So we, <coughs> according to that, <coughs> we study this week, we'll be studying <coughs> the 5th and 6th chapters. Both these chapters are connected with, the, with, this, with, the, with this day, around this time of year, in which the world was created. Now this sicha from the Rebbe was, was said on the 25th of Elul. That year, that Shab the Shabbos was the 25th of Elul. The 25th of Elul is actually the day that the world was created. Uh, the fifth chapter begins, the world was created with ten utterances, ten mamaros, ten utterances, and the sixth chapter concludes everything which the Holy One, blessed be He, created in this world. He created only for his glory. So the idea of the nature of creation uh, is prominently uh, explained, prominently mentioned in these two chapters of Perkyavos, the last two chapters. This reflects the state of the creation of the first day. Then the entire host of the heavens and earth, talking about the angels, were brought into being, and they were still united with God. This is implied by the Torah's description of the first day of creation as Yom Echad, not Yom Rishon. Day one, the day of the one. Structurally, this expression, it should be saying Yom Rishon, the first day, would have been more appropriate. But no, it says Yom Echad to imply that it was a day of oneness. God was one with his world. It was Op it was openly evident how everything was created for his glory. Picture the scene. On the first day, the world was created, heavens and the earth were created. Nothing, absolutely nothing was separate from God. Unlike today, when there are many things separate from God, obviously, people and creations and ways of doing things and all kinds of things, there's a tremendous separation uh, in the world. But at the beginning, there was no separation at all. When creation took place, everything was one with God. May we, the Rebbe says, uh, may we be able to stand with the power and firmness of Atem Nitzavim, the power of a king, and as implied by Parshas Vayelech, proceed from strength to strength until we appear before God in Zion. So, just to conclude, I'd just like to mention a few things dealing with this part, this Shabbos, and uh, this week. This week is a time of preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's a very auspicious time. It's a time that we, as we say, we get all our ducks in a row. We get everything ready uh, for the, the special holy days, not just spiritually, but physically. Physically, make sure that all of our food is made, make sure that we have... Uh, we have prepared our home in the proper way. Make sure that we know where we're going to be and what we're going to be doing. Make sure that we have a chauffeur if we're going to be at home and we know how to blow the chauffeur or we've made arrangements to come to shul and hear the chauffeur. 
whatever it may be, to make sure that we've gone to, we should go through the, the uh, moxer and make sure that we, we see what the moxer is saying and the various order of the prayers. If you have any questions, you can ask me. I'd be happy to answer any questions about how it's to be done. There are certain changes this year than we have in the past. For example, the chauffeur is not blown on the first day of Rosh Hashanah because we are afraid that uh, you might go and carry the chauffeur outside in a place where there's no air where you're not allowed to carry. So the rabbis determined that we did not blow the chauffeur on Shabbos. It was blown in the, uh, in the Beis HaMikdash, in the temple, but here we do not blow it. We only, so we'll only be blowing the chauffeur on Sunday. Interestingly, the first day of Rosh Hashanah, chauffeur is a biblical commandment. And here we see the power of the rabbis that the rabbis' decree was even, would even negate a biblical law of blowing the shofar. So it's an incredible idea, the power of the rabbis to, to legislate and to recognize. And why is that? Because as the parsha this week mentions, the Torah is not given in heaven, it's down here on earth. The Torah is to be determined down here on earth. And who makes the determinations as far as what's to be, but the rabbis, the Orthodox rabbis are the ones who we turn to for advice and they give us advice of how to, to uh, keep the mitzvahs of the Torah and in what ways to do that. So they've determined that we should not read the, we should not hear the shofar on Rosh Hashanah when it comes in Shabbos. So this year we are not going to be hearing the shofar from a biblical perspective. The second day blowing the shofar is a rabbinical law, not a biblical law. So does that mean we lose out? And the answer is definitely not. By coming to shul and by not blowing the shofar and by davening the way we should, we are doing exactly what we should be doing when we blow the shofar. That not blowing the shofar is just like hearing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. It's the same thing. By our powers of, of teshuva and tzedakah and tefillah, prayer, uh, charity and acts of kindness and uh, repentance, we are able to accomplish spiritually what the shofar was, it was able to accomplish physically by hearing the shofar. So we will be hearing the shofar only on Sunday. And indeed, it's a mitzvah to hear the shofar on Sunday. Either you should blow it yourself with the appropriate blessings or come to shul. And most shuls, Certainly Chabad shuls are having separate chauffeur, uh, chauffeur services at the end of the service. We will be having it at, at 12 o'clock on, uh, on Sunday outside in the parking lot. And again at 6 o'clock just before Mincha, also on Sunday in the parking lot. Also, we are not going to be doing Tashlik. We don't go to a river or a body of water with fish in it, which is usually done on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and since we're postponing it, it can be postponed throughout the week of the 10 days of the Tempe. So you don't have to go on Sunday, you can go anytime during that time, I believe even until the Shana Rabba. So uh, the idea is that it should be less so. So that's it, we're going to be having a beautiful Rosh Hashanah wherever we are. Let's be positive, let's be upbeat, and let's pray to God that this should be a year of healing for us and for the entire world. And God willing that this should be what is needed before Mashiach to come. And God willing, even before Rosh Hashanah this week, may we all merit to have Mashiach Tikeno coming immediately in our day.